Welcome to day three of the ninth Atlanta Summit on Global Health. Um, yesterday was extraordinary. It was CDC Director Rochelle Walensky. And um, hmm, I'm having a hard time here. Uh, with Rochelle Walensky and the panel talking about vaccines and where we're going and how we're going to distribute those vaccines and how we're going to get greater number of people vaccinated. If you missed it, please check it out on our YouTube channel. The focus today is what are the essential reforms that we should adopt coming out of this pandemic and how do we achieve them? Before we begin, I want to thank our partners in this summit, CARE USA, the Carter Center, and the Center for Strategic and International Studies, CSIS, um, and our content partner, Dr. Helene Gale, CEO of the Chicago Community Trust. Our presenting sponsors are the UPS Foundation, Avenos, John Snow, Inc. Supporting partners are Pain Care Labs, Dr. Amy Baxter, the Atlanta Global Studies Center, the Georgia State University School of Public Health, the GSU Center for Urban Language Teaching and Research, Kennesaw State University, Wellstar College of Health and Human Services, and the Morehouse School of Medicine, their Office of Global Equity. Uh, Carolyn Hart is going to introduce today's program. Carolyn is Vice President of JSI's International Division overseeing more than 100 country-based and global projects focused on supply chain, infectious disease, nutrition, and reproductive maternal and child health. So Carolyn, over to you. Thank you, Ambassador Shapiro. I'm delighted to be here and delighted JSI could be a co-sponsor of this terrific event. It's my honor to introduce today's opening session during which Steve Morrison will interview Gail Smith. Steve Morrison is the Senior Vice President and Director of the Global Health Policy Center at CSIS. And those of us who've been attending for the last couple of days know that he's ably moderated other sessions. And um, I look forward to, to that today as well. And Gail Smith, the keynoter, is now at the US Department of State leading the COVID response and health security. And she was formerly the President and CEO of the ONE Campaign and the former administrator of the US Agency for International Development. She's also served as special assistant to the president and senior director for development and democracy at the National Security Council, a time during which she played a crucial role in galvanizing US response to Ebola in West Africa. She's also been a senior fellow at the Center for American Progress and co-founder of the Modernizing Foreign Assistance Network, among many other roles in government and with non-governmental organizations. And prior to public service, Gail was a journalist in Africa for over 20 years. She seems to me to be uniquely suited to this moment, and we just couldn't have a better senior leader in her position at state. I think both of these esteemed colleagues, Steve and Gail, are well known to most global health practitioners, and I know it'll be a rich and enlightening conversation. So Steve and Gail, over to you. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, uh, thanks, Charles, Hannah Rennie. Uh, thanks, Carolyn Hart. And thanks especially to Gail for being with us here today. Uh, this is the ninth Atlanta annual Atlanta Global Health Summit, which Helene and I and those from CARE and the World Affairs Council formed up almost a decade ago. And it's just great to be all together. I'm gonna to say a quick, couple of quick words about sort of where we are at this moment and then come back to Gail and ask her a number of questions about her role and this pivotal role as the, as the US envoy and some of the big issues that are in front of us right now. Um, I think it's fair to say that we've entered in these most recent weeks, recent months, we've entered a far more dangerous, uncertain, and costly phase of this pandemic. It's one that defied many of our expectations and it's changed in some ways fundamentally the calculations by the United States and by, and by, by virtually everyone around the world around what this all means. A couple of the high points, one is variants. Um, we now know and we're beginning to understand that it's variants that we have to fear the most and equip ourselves to deal with these 
um, these proliferating variants have achieved a speed and a destructiveness that outstrips institutions and norms and stokes urgency and a call to adjust strategies invest at higher levels and move with greater urgency at both home and abroad. A second is we become an embattled and very divide, divided world. Uh, we become very bifurcated into increasingly safe and large, a few increasingly safe and largely stabilized zones of well endowed states. And we fortunately we're in America among those that have largely succeeded in, in controlling the virus, though not completely. And there's still a nervous and fragile condition to that. But that's starkly contrasted with an increasingly dangerous zone that's on fire where you're battling controlled, uncontrolled transmission, um, increasingly destructive surges, overwhelming medical systems, and uh, affecting even those very competent Asian states that just a short while ago we thought had really been quite triumphant in the face of this. A related, a related to that is the whole searing problem of vaccine inequity. The world's now visibly divided into haves and have nots and the disparities in access and other essential tools are widening. And the variant stoked acceleration of outbreaks in India and Brazil in particular have really, and the fact that they have seeded outbreaks in their regions have only increased the urgency around this. And it's generated a lot more uncertainty and desperation and we're seeing high income countries increasingly pitted um, against low and middle income countries in the scramble for vaccine doses. We're seeing much more resentment and, and anger being expressed. Um, another thing we're seeing is a change, a fundamental change of timeline. You know, the battle against, we've come to realize that the battle against COVID-19 is gonna be a long war, far longer than originally anticipated against a virus that many are arguing is becoming endemic. And for, mu for much of that world, that fight will stretch well into 2023 and 24 and likely beyond. The last high, high level point is just the price tag. There's growing recognition by world leaders that to address the multiple crises caused by this pandemic, both short and long-term are going to inqu inquire enormous investments over several years. We've had the most recent declaration made by Kristalina Georgieva, Managing Director of the IMF, Dr. Tedros, Head of WHO, David Malpass, President of World Bank, and Ngozi Nkonjo Uela of the WTO, World Trade Organization, in the op-ed this week in the Post, calling for a $50 billion investment to deal with the immediate vaccine crisis that we face and some of the recovery efforts. Um, this is just one. I mean, we will be hearing about the IMF study, the Rockefeller Foundation just come. There's a lot of work coming out in this period. At home, we've seen the consolidation of gains. That's giving us greater confidence and, and ability to move forward in our international work. I think that the confidence we have is partly responsible for the decision to appoint Gail to this position. That doesn't mean that we're completely comfortable with what's happening at home, which still remains subject to waning immunity and fear of variants and hesitancy and the like, but the international and the domestic agendas are getting very fused. And I think there's a recognition that we have to do far more on the international side. And we'll hear more about that from Gail. We're, we've, in 2020, there was a stark and sort of shocking absence of high-level diplomacy as this crisis unfolded. There were a few exceptions around the COVAX creation and the ACT accelerator, but there was a dominance of nationalism and inwardness and geopolitical confrontations between the US and China and others of fragmentation. We're coming out of that period in some, to some degree right now. We're seeing the reemergence of high-level diplomacy and this is a busy season. And so terribly timely, World Health Assembly just concluded its work, just had the EU um, G20 health meeting the 21st, the independent panel just finished its work and reported out to World Health Assembly. And next week, we'll have the G7 summit. All of these events are ones that touch directly on the work that Gail is undertaking at the State Department. So thank you so much, Gail, 
for joining us. I've got some specific things to talk about, but I want to ask you first and foremost, what's it mean to be an envoy? Um, it means that you're busy and you don't sleep much, but it also means that quite honestly, you've got the privilege to try to do everything we can on this. And my role at the State Department, because we've got a big team across the federal government, <clears throat> Uh, and it's a, it's a role I agree to on a temporary basis, uh, is to build out our global response, number one. Number two, lay the groundwork for what we call global health security. How do we position the world, institutions, norms, our own countries, other countries, to prevent, detect, and respond to the future global health threats we know are coming? And also to work with the department on its role as it thinks about this kind of threat over the next 10, 15 years. So it's been busy, hit the ground running. Uh, so that's basically my job. But as I say, I'm part of the big team. And when you say temporary, you mean this is more of an interim kind of appointment. And yeah. by definition, yeah. an envoy is not necessarily permanent. It's an envoy. It's a special envoy. It's, I'm, I'm actually called a coordinator. Because if you have international COVID envoy, it's called ICE. And uh, I'm, I'm the coordinator. The All State right. Department coordinator on those two things, the global response and global health security. Yes. OK, so let's talk about a few things that are there at the moment. There's been a lot of discussion this week and before about WHO reform. Um, Dr. Tedros um, is coming up for renewal or uh, coming up for the possibility of a second term. Um, there's been uh, a lot contained in the independent panel on pandemic preparedness and response, uh, on the reform talking about getting out of earmarked budgets, changing to a budget that gives it more ability to operate, um, giving it greater inspection authority, uh, changing its approaches, being faster, faster in terms of response and declarations of emergencies, um, having higher quality and accountability. Um, are you hopeful that this agenda can be moved forward as the U.S. reconnects with WHO, and 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 what are mm -hmm. you? What's the strategy for moving forward in this next period, in your in your view, on what is really an important way of strengthening WHO at this time and rebuilding American confidence and investment in WHO? Yeah, I, well, I think there are a couple of things to that, uh, Stephen. Yes, I am optimistic. I'd say a couple of things. The first is. I think, yes, we have to think about WHO reform, but we've also got to think about WHO modernization, by which I mean that the lens through which we should be looking is one that tells us how we strengthen those elements that have not been as strong as they need to be, given what we know from this pandemic. But also, we've got to think out 10 or 15 years all the time. How do we make sure that WHO is fit for purpose, not just for the current pandemic, but for the range of kinds of global health threats we may see in the future. So I think that's one important mm -hmm. point. Second point is that the reform and modernization of WHO and frankly other institutions, I think is nested in a broader strategy for going forward. The, the second is to think about norms. We've got something called the international health regulations. Countries are signed up. Adherence to those norms is quite frankly, not what it should be. So how do we make sure that we've got the norms we need, but also adherence to the norms? Third piece, and you mentioned there's a big price tag here, and I think that the IMF and Bank and WTO and WHO, we're talking about the immediate response. Right. But there's a big price tag to setting the world up so that we do not repeat what we've all been living through over the last 18 months. That requires figuring out what sustainable financing is. And this is a big priority for us and for me because relying just on foreign aid budgets that may go up or down. You know, we did a lot of that after Ebola. The world was ready to do a lot of this after Ebola and, and relied on an unpredictable uneven flow of capital. And then the last and the, the expert reports that you mentioned touched on this, I think, in very important ways. How do we ensure the transparency that is needed? You need transparency to track, monitor, catch up with and ultimately defeat a virus the accountability and the oversight. Because the world is only gonna be as good as each of us are at adhering to the norms, making the institutions strong, but living up to the things we sign up to. 
So, so I would nest the WHO reform in that broader, broader strategy. So you mentioned the independent panel. We talked about yeah. that. It's it's contains a number of fairly bold proposals, right? In terms of a council of heads yeah. of state. Tell us a bit about your thoughts on some of those bigger proposals that are put forward. I, I'd say, and and look, Steve, you've served in government also. We haven't made final decisions. I would say we welcome uh, the recommendations from that panel. And there are other panels. There's a G20 panel, there's a European panel. Fortunately, we've got the benefit of a lot of really smart minds and experts coming together to say, here are the kinds of things that we need. Um, I think we're quite excited about the boldness of some of the proposals, eager to work through them, uh, see what works. We're talking to many partner countries about some of these to figure out how we move forward on many of them. So I think, uh, I, I would say our view is we're exceedingly fortunate to have those recommendations to work with and so many intelligent, knowledgeable minds uh, giving their best to what the world needs to do. It's quite exciting. That's great, that's great. Um, on the origins controversy and the Wuhan Institute for Virology, um, there's been a pretty dramatic shift of opinion within the scientific community as well as the analytic community. I mean, our own government is pressing for um, a, a much more serious investigation, the possibility of lab yeah. leak as against to a sort of zoonosis, natural spillover from animal to human species. But it looks, it looks like a deadlock. I mean, it looks like uh, very difficult to imagine how to get out of this box at this point, any thoughts on that? I, you know, I'm, I'm, that's not my primary focus to be yeah. frank, but I think yeah. that the world needs in the US will keep pressing for an independent fact-based investigation. And, you know, a lot of this gets politicized. The fact is, and I think many of the people watching this know this, when you are fighting a virus, whether it's HIV, whether it is Ebola, whether it is COVID-19 or a variant. You need every bit of data, science, evidence, and information you can lay your hands on to help you understand the virus so you can more effectively go after it. And that's the really important thing. And I think that's why the US government has been consistent in saying there must be an independent science and evidence-based investigation to figure out the actual facts on the origins. Thank you. On the vaccine crisis, I mean, yeah. we know that there's a certain urgency to this. I mean, the, the call to Big action urgency to this. from the agency heads, and it's going to be enormously expensive and complicated to pull off. I mean, we're talking 50 to 75 billion, depending on which, which source you're looking at, over an 18 month period, combining a lot of different funding mechanisms and responses. Um, are we, how are we going to come to terms, do you believe, with the sticker shock of this? We haven't yet really had a debate around those kind of numbers, those kind of numbers around what it really is going to take in order to cope with the, right. it over the next 18 months. Those are big numbers. I think they are big numbers, but they are smaller numbers than the cost of an unchecked pandemic. So you know, any way you square it, what the world has spent to date, I think drives home the evidence that it is a cost-effective investment to make sure that there are enough vaccines out there that we can bring the pandemic to an end. And I think we've also got to, on this, Steve, think about more than just the sort of singular cost. Like we're operating on five or six fronts. How do we get producers to produce more this year? Right. How and where can we invest in local production where we think with an injection of capital through our development finance institution, you can increase production starting as early as the fall. We're making good progress on that. How do we ramp up funding for COVAX? And there's been some good news uh, on that from the Gavi meeting this week. How do we fix the supply chain problems? I mean, the, the global architecture for vaccine production is built to produce at a much lower level than the demand is right now. So there've been all sorts of challenges on supply. How do you break that down? Uh, and how do we expand and maximize dose sharing, which I'm pleased the president has been out there with a 
80 million number. We've had more things to say on that very recently. We're working with partners all over the world to get those numbers up so that in the aggregate, we can start to get the kind of global coverage that is urgently needed. We're seeing calls coming from multiple directions now for the G7 next week to come out with a pledge of a, at least a billion doses, uh, a surplus shared doses uh, over the course of this year and then the higher numbers next year. You think that's realistic? I, I think there's, I mean, my sense, and I talk to obviously a lot of G7 partners often, uh, I, I think there's a real commitment on the part of the G7 uh, to do more, to act as a body. I'm very hopeful about the summit. Uh, you may know this about summits for others that this is my, I don't know, 18th or something, if you count G7s and G8s and G20s. Uh, a lot of the final negotiations are in the time leading up to it. But I think if you look at some of the recent announcements from various G member, G7 member countries, I think we're going to be on a good track. I'm very hopeful it'll be a good week next week. Good. I mean, I was encouraged to see the big pledge this week at the AMC for the COVAX facility. Yep. That was an, another good sign of support internationally. But COVAX has taken some tough hits, right? I mean, the export ban on the Serum Institute of India that the Indian government's imposed has had a pretty stark impact on the yeah. export of the AstraZeneca doses. There's been some very tough-minded and deeply detailed analyses out of the Wall Street Journal and elsewhere about some of the stumbles or miscalculations that were made. Uh, tell us, I mean, I, from what you've said and from the official position in the United yeah. States, we're still very much committed as the lead investor and partner with COVAX. But what do you say to an American public that's reading these accounts and going, my gosh, it looks to me like this is hanging by a thread and operationally and being able to deliver uh, in the midst yeah. of this urgent crisis? How do you how do you respond to those who may just be reading this stuff and saying this doesn't look like much of a solution? Yeah, well, I'd say a couple of things. I think first and foremost, we consider COVAX a critically important partner and it is the global delivery platform. And it was built on Gavi, which has a very strong record of success. And so that's one of the first points I would make. I think you're right about COVAX faced some challenges in its first year, and you referred to one with respect to the fact that doses are no longer available and won't be for some time from the Serum Institute. The other is that if you look at pledges that were made in its first year, they both fell far short of the target in year one. And a lot of them were pledges. And COVAX needed to be out there getting into the business of signing contracts. And right. you can't make a down payment with a promise. You have to have actual cash. So one of the things that we have been urging our fellow donors to do is yes, make your pledges, but deliver the cash because that enables COVAX to get on the market. I think we're gonna see with COVAX having more cash in hand with this move to get increased production with increased dose sharing, I think we're gonna see a real uptick from COVAX and we found them to be a good partner. And quite frankly, we feel it's also in our interest to partner with them to help them be as strong and effective as they can be. Thank you. Now, there, when, when the US trade rep, Catherine Tai made the announcement yeah. just recently about the United States would, would join in the WTO uh, effort at, at, at examining the, the, the suspension of, 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 uh, of patents of intellectual property and in the midst of this emergency. It set off quite a bit of debate and controversy here yeah. in the United States, but much of that debate and controversy was about this move and what did this, what might this do with reference to production versus what might this do in terms of motivating the vaccine developers and manufacturers to think differently about the future. And it also is often followed by, well, you know what we really need here are innovative partnerships that are gonna expand the manufacturing base, accelerate things, fix the supply chains, yeah. get the bases of production out into Latin America, Africa, Asia, where they're needed closer to the, uh, closer to the populations that most need them. So how do these pieces connect up? I mean. The U.S. has taken this position. It's sticking with this position. It's yeah. also emphasizing 
the second part of this. So how do yeah. these pieces tie together in your view? I, I think the way they fit together is it's a combination of what we need to do now, but also a lot of that is for the future. And obviously vaccine production is concentrated. Um, the architecture is less robust than it needs to be for the volume that is needed in an emergency. So how do you solve that? And the US position on supporting a temporary TRIPS waiver uh, was based on the fact, as the US Trade Representative said at the time, this is an utterly extraordinary once in a century moment. And we've got to be willing to take extraordinary actions and look at every single opportunity. Now, it was not anticipated, nor should it have been, that taking that position was going to suddenly bring about the delivery right. of vaccines. What it does is opens a debate, a discussion. They go into text negotiations. Uh, and I'm very glad we've taken the position because I think it does have an impact and I think it does affect the, the nature of the discussion, quite frankly. But at the same time, I just want to underscore a, a point you made that is really, really critical. We need to expand and decentralize vaccine production so that there isn't a reliance on too few producers and there's greater access in more regions of the world. And that's where our strategy with the DFC comes in is how can we start doing that now, but also for the future? Because think of the vaccines we all know, those of us who work on global health, of the childhood diseases, the other things we've all worked on for so long. If those vaccines can be produced in more places, that's also effective and more cost-effective. Gail, um, I know we're, we're gonna run short of time soon and we don't wanna ask, too much of your time in the midst of all of the other pressures on you. Let's talk a bit about pandemic financing, sort of long-term financing yeah. for partner states, mostly low-income countries, lower middle-income countries in terms of working with those countries. They are gonna be investing more in their capacities. They're gonna need more access to better pandemic financing. There's a lot of discussion going on. The administration's played a very vitally important role in trying to stimulate those conversations. You've participated, uh, Ambassador L L Linda Thomas Greenfield has been involved. Uh, Vice President Harris ha has been involved. Um, and in the current budget for FY22, there's a modest amount, 250 million of that billion in global health security funding that's seen as sort of a down payment moving forward. But my understanding is we're in a phase right now, a transition phase of thinking ahead on what some kind of coalitional effort would look like. It may not be a new fund per se, it may be some kind of coalitional effort that is a mechanism for getting these resources in and the demand is somewhere between 10 and 25 or 30 billion a year, depending on how, what you're counting under all of this. And I understand there's consideration of the US playing a role of in the fall and perhaps convening folks, but looking ahead to having a game plan that can be entered into the deliberations over the next fiscal yes. year budget and the like. So that's a long-winded way of what can you tell us about the strategy on this? Yeah. And, and look, this is a really uh, tough nut to crack, but I'm as focused on this as could possibly be because we got to crack it. Yeah. And the challenge is is that if we say for pandemic financing, for building the capacity of countries to prevent, detect, and respond, right? For closing the holes in the net, that we're gonna rely on aid budgets and that's gonna sustainably finance us for the next several years. Right. I've been the aid administrator. I've worked on multiple budgets and aid budgets fluctuate. They go up and down, and there's not a guarantee of predictable financing if we rely solely on ODA. So what other means of financing do we look at? And that's why we're talking to banks, we're talking to finance ministers, we're talking to development leads, we are talking to the OMB or budget equivalents in developing countries to look at what all the options are for generating enough capital to get the job done, but making sure it's sustainable and it's predictable. Because if we don't, we're at risk of repeating what happened after Ebola. I was in the Obama administration then, we marshaled a lot of interest through the global health security agenda, mobilized resources, commitments from wealthier countries to provide assistance, and it lasted for a while. 
but it ultimately wasn't sustained. Politics change, leaders change, governments change, other aid priorities step into the mix. So this time, and given how much we have spent over the last 16 months, I think the world has an obligation to figure this out. So that's our aim. We don't have all the answers yet, uh, but we're trying to be as creative as we can to look at a combination of things that would ensure a steady, regular flow of capital so we can get the job done and not look at it as a project that eh, maybe we finish and maybe we don't. Can't afford to do it that way. Thank you. Um, one last question. Sure. Um, you're at the State Department. Um, you're a, a oh. transitional, you're a temporary, you're, you're there on, not on a permanent basis as the coordinator. Yeah, I'm on leave. To, what to is do. the, yeah. you know, uh, the State Department's going to need, I would expect, more capacity on a durable, ba on an enduring basis institutionally in global health security. You have any thoughts on that? I, I do. I'm not going to go too far in sharing them now because I want to share them within the department. I think one of the other things, though, that is true, and state, look, state's got a hugely important role. It's the, the lead in engaging with countries. It's the lead in building the coalitions we need to get jobs done. And it's got a huge role on a whole host of threats, including on the global health security front. Um, we also have an extraordinary richness of expertise across the U.S. government. And one of the things that I think is effective, I found it so in Ebola, and it's the case here, is that it's bringing all of those together. So it's a question of, I think, the State Department's role, but across the US government, um, we're always doing a fairly steady gut check of do we have what we need to remain agile, to be able to handle these. Uh, and hopefully I'll be able to say something more about it later, because I'm kind of keeping one eye on how does the US government need to be positioned for this in the future based on, it seems a number of global health crises. And I mean this sincerely, I've had the privilege to, to work on. So if you were to project out, looking five years out in terms of the changed approach, changed structure of the US engagement internationally on these issues of pandemic preparedness, given what we've just, the trauma we have witnessed, it's not over yet, but also the awareness that this may be the mild version of what we experience. Yeah. And, and, and we're in a microbial universe that's generating, throwing a lot more at us faster, more furiously, and with greater havoc. What would you think we're going to look like in terms of the way that we organize ourselves internationally? Because right now we're, we've got very dedicated and smart people in different parts of our government doing very important things at AID, at CDC, at, at HHS, at the State Department, at DOD and elsewhere. Um, but it's, it's, not, it's not been laid out to respond. It's not been designed with the idea of this magnitude uh, and complexity uh, that we face today. Right. I, I think... It, on the international side, I go back to this notion of modernization, how do we make sure the international architecture is fit for purpose? And we're actively engaged in that discussion and frankly, very focused on, let's have bold yet practical discussions because we can all agree that this can never happen again. That doesn't get us anywhere. We got to get down to brass tacks. Yeah. I think on the US government side, but I think this is true for governments around the world, is that those of us who've worked in global health for a very long time know global health well. Global health is a, a path towards the well being of citizens, communities, and countries. It is also an area where, whether it's, it's AMR or whether it's a virus, can be very dangerous. And I think what we're seeing is a deepening of the understanding around the world of finance ministers, foreign ministers, national security officials other economic officials of the fact that global health is something that is in fact all encompassing. I mean, let's not forget that we have a, a global health crisis with the pandemic that has triggered a global economic crisis that has triggered a number of shadow crises. If you look at what's happening with food insecurity, if you look at what's happening in rising joblessness. So my hope, and I think what will happen is that we will see a greater broadening of an understanding 
of the fact that health is not a sector that yeah. lives over over here. It's something much broader than that. And yeah. I would say, and you did not ask me to do this, but I think the work that you've done at CSIS and others have done to build out that understanding is really, really key. This is a multifaceted crisis. And if we look at it as just a health crisis, as opposed to also an economic crisis, a political crisis, a security crisis, a food security crisis, uh, we're not gonna get to where we need to go. So we gotta broaden the effort. Yeah, yeah. Do I have time for one more question? Sure. Um, we touched on China a little bit with respect to the origin controversy. Yeah. And the Wuhan Institute of Virology. The broader question is, how are we going to be able to engage China in this moment in time, right? We've been in a period, certainly during the Trump administration, of a pretty toxic meltdown, a lot of stigmatization, a lot of uh, conspiratorial, borderline racist rhetoric that was used. We're now back into a pretty tough relationship, but we're also identifying areas in climate change as well as global health, where we need to continue to find a way forward in the collaboration. The Chinese now have two vaccines that qualify for emergency use licensing under WHO. They'll qualify for COVAX. They have an active diplomacy on vaccines, which if they're, if they're moving product that's safe and effective, we should favor that. Um, and what is, how does this fit? How does the China yeah. piece fit in your, in your thinking about what US diplomacy should be focused upon in this period because it's a tough issue, but it's a really important one. No, it's a really important one. And I, I'd say two things. Uh, yes, China does have two vaccines approved for emergency use. I think, uh, let's just say it's a bit transactional in how yeah. it proceeds with its quote unquote vaccine diplomacy. And I think there's a distinction there. And I think the president's been very clear on that as we proceed to share this first tranche of doses that he's announced. Look, this is nested in a much broader debate deliberation on US-China policy. This is a new administration. Clearly, the president's made it a priority. Uh, I'm gonna frankly leave it to those experts to figure out where we go with China. And I think that will shape then how we proceed with China on, on matters of global health more broadly. But you're absolutely right. It's a very big issue. And it's one that's gonna have to be wrestled to the ground as the world figures out how we proceed because these viruses, they don't know borders. Gail, they thank you. They go wherever we let them go. Yeah, Gail, Thanks. you've been really generous. Thank you so much. And we're really grateful for the service you're providing the country in this moment. Again, in this really critical moment, it's really important. And thank you well, so thank much. You. And uh, we'll look forward to interacting and whatever we can do to support you. Thank you so much. And thanks everybody for Joining this event, it's really important. It's encouraging to know there's so many people interested in this critical issue. Thank you.